Hi. Um, thanks for coming tonight uh, on a school night. It's particularly kind of you to come out. And thank you, Ellen, uh, for helping to arrange this. Um, particularly happy to be here at the Newton Library because it's a place that has a lot of importance to me and my family. Both my children uh, grew up through the library system here, and uh, some of the wonderful librarians even got to know them by name and actually even knew what kinds of books they preferred. So uh, it was very formative for them, a uh, wonderful place for us. We spent ha hundreds of productive and not so productive hours here. Um, so thanks very much um, for inviting me tonight and to you as well. Okay, um, so I'm here to talk about uh, my new book. It's called, um, I think you probably know, Cheap, the High Cost of Discount Culture. And uh, the most common question I get asked um, when I'm going around uh, talking about this book is, why the heck did you write a book called Cheap? Uh, and I always say, uh, I always give the same answer. Um, I wrote the book, uh, what inspired me to do this book was what usually inspires my work, which is not deep thought or heavy reading, but my own personal experience. And in this case, it all started with the, with the boot incident. Um, uh, we were planning to go to a New Year's Eve party, and as typical for me, um, I had purchased an outfit for this party that was, uh, I thought, a very, very good deal. Uh, I am what psychologists call, and they really use these terms, um, a deal-prone person. I, I love bargains, or at least I did before I, brought, I started this project. And um, I'd found this great top, you know, at a fraction of the price that um, was indicated on the price tag. Um, I was really proud of myself for this find, and now the only thing to do is to go out and buy a pair of boots to go um, with this top. Now, this being New England, of course, we wear boots even inside for New Year's Eve parties, so that's why boots were the thing. And I went down to my local uh, shoe store uh, and asked to try on the boots. He brought on a, a selection of boots, and... Um, most of them were kind of clunky, they weren't too comfortable, and, and finally I said, look, can you bring me out some, some really nice boots, you know, some fashionable boots that would, you know, kind of complement this wonderful outfit that I thought I'd bought at, at great, uh, great discount. And he said, sure, and he brought out a couple of pair of boots. One was from Italy and one was from Spain. The Italian boots were particularly nice. I absolutely love them. They fit perfectly. Uh, they look great. And then I looked at the price tag. Sticker shock big time. And I said, you know, I'm deal prone. I didn't know it at the time, but I love bargains. I'm not going to buy these boots. And of course, I bought a pair of those clunky boots, and I bet you know where they were made. Um, wore them the next night uh, to this lovely event. They were just as uncomfortable as I thought they were going to be. And um, the next morning early when I got back to my house, I took them off and threw them into the back of my closet into what I now call my pile of shame. Now, I don't know if any of you have a pile of shame, but I have a shamefully large pile of shame. Uh, I have gar garments that um, I never wore or I just wore once, some with a price tag still on them, all huddled in the back of my closet. And in fact, um, my husband's been kind enough to point out to me that they actually exceed the number of clothes that I actually wear. Um, and again, I think this is a very familiar thing to many of us. Um, what these things have in common is pretty much uniformly, they were all bought on sale, right? They're deeply discounted, okay? What got me to buy them was not the item itself, but the fact that it was reduced by such a large percentage that I could not resist it. So I may do with things that were maybe a bad color and not quite, you know, a good fit, because of the great deal I thought I was getting. Well, this got me to think a little bit about my behavior. I'm, I, I pride myself on being a really rational person. I'm, I have a scientific background. I'm empirically you know, inclined. I really believe in, in fact-based, evidence-based things. It got me thinking about all that. And then I started to think, being a discursive person, about another problem that I'd run into. And that was the socks, OK? Now. The socks to go with boots? Not really. These are the socks that I would buy from my kids, most, most generally. They are uh, athletic socks, or everyday socks. I would go uh, to, a, to a discount store and buy a pair of socks for less than a dollar, okay? And where was the provenance of these socks? I, best, I bet you can guess that they came from the same place the shoes came from. 
that came from China, and it got me thinking, my gosh, a pair of socks that was manufactured in China on real machinery with real hands, put into a box, put into a container ship, floated flat across the Pacific Ocean to Los Angeles or elsewhere, another port, put into a truck or another conveyance, taken all the way to New England, where I live, put into a store, and sold to me with profit made every single step of the way. How was that possible? How was that even possible? And this had always really puzzled me. Well, how many of you have participated in this activity? This is Black Friday, okay? We all are familiar with Black Friday. That is the day after Thanksgiving we go to give thanks, yeah? And this is how we give thanks. This is the most popular shopping day of the year, the day after Thanksgiving. And the reason we go that day is not really to give thanks, right? It's because we think the prices are going to be the lowest of the year. So we know about this freneticism, and I was very familiar with it, and I was kind of, uh, you know, not part I don't usually participate in this activity. I, I kind of thought myself better than that. But I'm not. I also was familiar with Walmart, okay? And it's very easy to, de uh, to demonize Walmart, as this uh, individual did. Walmart, we sell for Satan, always. Um, you know, but it go I decided that if I was really going to get to the bottom of this, because I'm not a frequent Walmart shopper, those of you who live in Newton know it's not terribly convenient here to shop at Walmart, but here I was participating in this kind of behavior, and I really wanted to understand it. And thinking about this led me on this long journey that ended in this book, Cheap. Now, like all journeys, this begins with a bit of history, in journalism at least. And I traced Cheap back to when it wasn't, and that is before the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Re Revolution, nothing was cheap, or virtually nothing was cheap. All consumer goods were costly, obviously, because they required hand crafting, or they were crafted on simple machinery, okay? So before the Industrial Revolution, there was no cheap. What came, what brought us the Industrial Revolution? Well, many of us think, we learned about this in, in grade school, I think, that Eli Whitney and the invention of the cotton gin, there we go, is what precipitated or anticipated the Industrial Revolution. But in fact, as I did my research, it turned out not to be Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney actually was involved in a lot of litigation over his cotton gin and was unable to get it off the ground. In the meantime, another seminal character who you may or may not have heard of named Simeon North was the gentleman who actually is considered the father of mass production. Simeon North was a humble uh, producer of agricultural implements. He made... Uh, size and hose and things like that. But he was enlisted to produce armaments after the Revolutionary War. And the reason for that was that the guns that were used in the Revolutionary War, those of you who are historians know this, that were produced in the United States were not just subpar, they were dangerous. They backfired, they misfired, the muskets, you know, were just a mess. And after the war, then President Washington said, we're going to have to produce some homegrown guns that, that work well. So Simeon North got the contract to produce these guns and he came up with this ingenious method of producing them by dividing the task that sometimes took up to $300 for a, uh, $300, sorry, 300 hours for a master craftsman to achieve. He took that task and divided it up into individual tasks, okay? So he took the process, the master, you know, the process that required um, masterful craftsmanship and divided up into smaller pieces that could be repeated over and over again. And this allowed the production of, of fine guns, and these are two of actual Simeon North pistols. I'm sorry, it's not a great photograph. I, obviously, there aren't a lot of them around. Um, uh, for a relatively low price. And this was, it, so this was the beginning of mass production in the United States. Here we have the textile mills, and you can see here the kind of people, the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, you can see the kind of people who are now employed manufacturing goods in the United States. Okay? They're no longer necessarily master craftsmen. They can be unskilled men, women, and children.